Awesome. So, so say and spell your name. Yes, I am Becky, B-E-C-K-Y, Ayers, A-Y-E-R-S, and I am a co-owner of Triskelion Brewing Company, and that's T-R-I-S-K-E-L-I-O-N. And what is your... My official your, title? Your official title. Titles. Uh, I am controller of shenanigans, which is like the, the, the top title. <laughs> uh, beer taster, barmaid in charge, uh, <laughs> co-brewer, <laughs> co-shenaniganizer, uh, head of security, uh, keeper of the money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, today is June 27th, 2018. Uh, and we are at Triskelion uh, Brewing in Hendersonville, North Carolina. So Becky, can we start by, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Where, you're, where, where are you from and how did you get here? I, I grew up here. Um, I've lived here. I've seen a lot of changes. I went to high school here. Um, I ended up going to college at Western Carolina University. Uh, oddly enough for nursing. <laughs> I got really burnt out. <laughs> Didn't want to be a nurse after all. Yeah. Uh, I did uh, live in Sarasota, Florida for a little while uh, with a, an ex-husband. Mm -hmm. When I got divorced, I came home. Uh, I met my uh, husband that same year, I married to Jonathan. He's also my business partner and co-owner of Triskelion. Uh, we've been together uh, 18 years and uh, it's, been, it's been good. So yeah, I grew up here. It's, it's a beautiful town. Awesome. It's uh, grown a lot, but it has somehow managed to keep that small town feel where you know you can walk somewhere and still see people you know and that you went to high school with. So it's yeah. kind of fun. But there's also this, all these new people, which is amazing. Uh, you know, you, you hear about small towns all the time talking about, well, you know, I hate all these new people moving to my town, you know, because they're changing it. And, you know, I'm not one of those. I think that change is good. When I turned 21 in this town, uh, there was no place to go. <laughs> I went bar hopping to both places <laughs> and that was it. There was no nightlife. There was no entertainment. There was nothing to keep kids occupied. Uh, when I was in high school, you know, before I reached high school, cruising Main Street was like mm -hmm. a big thing. You know, all the kids cruise Main but some of the downtown apartment residents, they thought we were too noisy. So when I entered high school and got my driver's license, they would block off Main Street <laughs> at, on a Friday and Saturday night starting about 7 p.m. So you, could, you, couldn't, you couldn't even cruise Main Street. So we had one movie theater, uh, we had a skating rink, and that was about it. So yeah. I definitely love the changes that Hendersonville has gone through. I mean, we've had our growing pains, but I think overall, I think that the area has improved. Uh, particularly 7th Avenue. 7th Avenue was not known for a great area of town. At one time, this was the center of town. This was where the people got on and off the train. So it, it was a, a life force to this community. And, and over the years, it kind of died back mm -hmm. and, and didn't, didn't progress in the same way that like Main Street did. But our city officials, our city councilmen, um, they have done a lot to try and improve our, our, our little street here. Yeah. Uh, this is my second business on 7th Avenue. My husband and I, we were in construction and we had a cabinet shop down at the other end by Lowe's. And uh, uh, one day he just like, you know, I really hate construction. I'm so burnt out. I've been doing it for 18, you know, at that time it was 16 years. And it's like, well, what are you going to do? And he's like, well, I want to go back to school. And I said, well, what do you want to do? He's like, I want to make beer. You know, we'd been home brewers for uh, about 10 years together. And he's like, yeah, I want to go learn how to make beer and open a brewery. And I'm like, all right, well, how are you going to make that happen? And he goes, well, funny you should ask. I enrolled in school today. <laughs> and I'm like, great. Nice. Thanks for talking to me about it. But uh, he did. He finished the uh, two-year general brewing uh, program at Blue Ridge Community College, which is a great school. Gabe Mixon is a, an extremely knowledgeable uh, teacher, especially in and around the beer industry. And um, he, he's, got a, he's got a great program over there. So John graduated. Uh, I continued to work. Uh, to keep us floating while John went to school and we ended up uh, opening this. Uh, we, I think we formed our LLC in 2014 mm -hmm. and we uh, officially opened a tasting room in our brew house which was the first building to get done and we opened that up on New Year's Eve and then we uh, got this one done uh, for Memorial Weekend so we were open for Garden Jubilee. Oh that's awesome. Yeah. We got a little bit ways to go yet. We still got a food truck that we're, we're implementing. We got a, a beer garden that we got to finish and we have an upstairs that you can rent. Uh, we're renting it out for $10 an hour. And that gets you uh, your own bartender and a private bathroom. And wow. the space holds about 50 people. So that's kind of like what we want. We want a community space. We want people to use it. And if it's if it's priced too high, you know, one's going to want to rent it. And yeah, I, I think that's a shame because it's a great space. It has two mountain views and you can see the two other new breweries coming in on, on 7th Avenue. So we're excited to have new neighbors. Very cool. As well as Southern Appalachian. They're, they're, they're the pioneers in this town. Right. Yeah, so, so we, we um, pay them homage a lot. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, you talked about homebrewing and that kind of being the, the, the switch. Kick, yeah. um, how did you get started even with that? The Mr. Beer Kit, <laughs> which was horrible. <laughs> and it was the worst beer ever. And it was so bad that uh, we were like, hey, we should do this again. So we, we actually got a second one. The first one was given to us. The second one we actually did buy. And it was equally horrible. And, but it did kind of fuel the, the, the flame to want to try and do something more with it. But it wasn't until about two or three years after we messed around with homebrewing that we actually have a friend of ours who is a award-winning, gold medal-winning BJCP homebrewer. And he kind of took us under his wing and our homebrew got significantly better after that. Uh, but we weren't real consistent with it. You know, we couldn't make a batch the same. And it wasn't mm -hmm. until, you know, John gained the knowledge through a professional program that we were able to, 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 to get through some of those issues that we were having as homebrewers. Yeah. And uh, being a homebrewer was the start of it, but uh, I'm, I'm glad he went to school because there was so much more in, in, in the education process that he learned that we didn't have access to as homebrewers. You know, so right. It's a different level. It's a completely different level. Right. So um, as y'all have kind of transitioned over from homebrewing to operating the brewery here, what kind of resources, uh, are there resources other than the, the community college program that you've kind of been able to lean on? Honestly, a lot of other brewers. Uh, they, they talk to other brewers, we're all friends. Uh, it's, it's, it's an extremely close-knit community. And I, I didn't, I've never been a bartender, like my whole life I've never been a bartender. Yeah. <laughs> so when we started to do research for this, you know, uh, you know, John interned at Oscar Blues, but you know, where do you go to intern to be a bartender? Well, I had a friend of mine who, who owns a tap house and she was like, yeah, come bartend with me. And she goes, can you be here ne next Thursday? I'm like, yep. <laughs> so I actually did have to learn to be a bartender. And then, you know, I still didn't know everything, obviously. So I, I did find a good tapper manager. He had right. been a bartender a long, long, long time. And right. he was able to, you know, carry us forward and teach me a lot more. Right. It's definitely a, it's, it's, it's a skill, you know, it's, it's not easy work. I don't know. I thought it was at one time. I thought, oh yeah, yeah anybody could be a bartender. And that's not true. <laughs> that's not true at all. <laughs> so I'm glad that I had that experience, but, uh, but yeah, the, the community, I mean, just having you walk into like a conference and say, Hey, we're a startup and there's everybody at the table. Hey, have you heard about this? And Hey, have you tried that? And Hey, what do you do about this? And, you know, and they just, it's a wealth of information and knowledge that is incredible. And yeah. uh, most industries aren't like that. So yeah. It's, it's really kind of refreshing that we have that. And then, and then there's pink boots for, you know, women brewers yeah. and women in the industry. And um, yeah, they've been a good source of, uh, of, of just, you know, just to support. Right. You know, and it's good to reach out to the, the communities that support you and, and get their help with things. We'll come back to Pink Boots in a little bit. I'll ask oh, good, more good. about yeah. that. Well, I'm a yes. new member, but I, I, won't, I, exactly. I don't have a lot of knowledge about them, but I, I do love what they've done yeah. and, and, and what they do for the industry, especially women in the industry. I think it's great. So to focus on Triskelion for a little bit, um, you talked about kind of what led you up to opening it. And, you know, you're from here. What led you to pick, like, Hendersonville, but also the Seventh Avenue area. Like, what led you to pick this area? Oh uh, well, I grew up here, love it. Uh, we have a 12-year-old son. I'm raising him here. It's a great place, and it's I don't know, it's just home. You know, <laughs> I mean, when I lived in Florida, it was I miss this place every day. These mountains just get into your soul, and it's, it's comforting to wake up and, and drive around and see them. You know, when I got divorced, the first thing I uh, the big memory I have about that whole time period because it was it was you know, divorce is never easy. So I'm driving up the grade. I mean, I'm approaching it. I'm coming out on 26 and there's the mountains right there. And I just start crying. I was like, oh my God, I'm home. You know, and uh, yeah, I, I don't really ever want to leave again. <laughs> it's just, this place is, is, is awesome. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people are seeing that. You know, people are moving to yeah. this area because it, we are very awesome. You got hiking, you got, you know, got tubing down the river. You got, you got all these great things. You got the brewery scene, you know, we, we just, we've grown so much and it's just, it's a cool place to live. <laughs> and you said that this area, the Seventh Avenue area, there's, did you say two more breweries that two more breweries are in planning here? In planning, yes. Wow. Yeah, one of them's Guidon Brewing. They're actually right above Southern Appalachian. And okay. there's a building right here on the corner of 7th and Locust that is, uh, he's already signed the lease. I can't tell you what his business name is because right. he's going through his trademark process right now. But he's a, he's a, a student at Blue Ridge right now in the program. Oh, cool. So we'll have another professional brewer on the 7th Avenue, like right on the street. Right. But yeah, 7th Avenue, why we chose 7th Avenue is, um, I guess, you know, it's all about location, location, location. And right after that is price, price, price. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. I mean, uh, Main Street would have been great, but the, the properties on Main Street were just uh, a little out of our price range. And 7th Avenue had the right price, 
definitely a good location and it is it is growing fast you know I mean in the last seven years we've had Southern Appalachian open in, up in the district we've had uh, the bakery which is amazing underground bakery and the meat market which has been here as long as I can remember it's a new owner now he's been there about four years and so right. he's he's come onto the district and it's just it's I don't know, it's, it's almost like a, we're our own community, but yet we're still part of Hendersonville. So we're, we're getting a lot of buzz in town about how we're so up and coming, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of that. Right. Uh, certainly not the start of it. <laughs> Kelly and Andy over at Southern App, they really have. They've really pushed the envelope here in trying to get this place, you know, where people want to come down. Because, again, it, it had a bad reputation for so long, and it really hasn't been bad at all for the mm -hmm. last 10 years at least and but people still in this town have that stigma and, and even locals tell new people don't go on 7th Avenue you know it's bad and I'm like it's not that bad <laughs> it's not even, not even bad at all look at this great place you know so yeah 7th Avenue is just when we were looking uh, we looked at several properties here on 7th Avenue just because you know there's not a lot of properties around where they're in a price range but uh, we drove by here and uh, there's no for sale sign on it we drove by here every day for 10 years with our other business and never even noticed anything <laughs> didn't even notice it was an empty lot you know we just drove by it like it was wallpaper and didn't even see it and then one day we were, when we we're looking for property we drove by like who owns this lot so we tracked him down and asked if he wanted to sell and he did so right we got a good deal <laughs> i wouldn't say a great deal but i I definitely say a good deal you know but uh but it, it is a good area. Uh, we love it. And um, I tell you, I love just walking down the street. Like uh, a friend of mine owns Lux Salon down here. Uh, and uh, she does my hair. <laughs> really cute and bright. Uh, we did a, a beer release with Pink Boots, and it was called Pinkies Up. So I, I had my hair dyed pink to, oh, that's to cool. go with the opening for that beer. What kind of beer was that? It was a uh, champagne yeast style beer. It was really good. <laughs> cool. I think I drank more of it than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's because I helped make it. I don't know, but right. it, it was a lot of fun. We had a, that was a Pink Boots uh, collaboration with Highlands, and it was a, it was so much fun. That's where I, I met Katie for the first time, and mm -hmm. she's she's been awesome. She's the girl I go to when I, I need some answers. You know, I'm afraid to ask other people. I'm like, hey, Katie, is it okay if I do this? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. Oh no, that's fine. Yeah, so she's kind of like my um, brewing industry etiquette person. Uh, did y'all meet through Pink Boots? Or through did Pink you Boots, yeah, through Pink Boots. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, I get to meet a lot of the women around the area. Uh, of course, uh, Jo, she is uh, Cicerone. She actually works at uh, White Labs, so I, I, got, I got to know her just from picking up yeast and stuff. But she's, she's really a sweetheart, too. You should put her on your interview. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting might be in front of camera. Yeah. Are there, other, are there other kind of folks in the area that you might would consider to be almost like a mentor or something like that? Uh, actually, Joe and Lisa from Sanctuary. Yeah. You know, um, I don't think I would survive mentally the first year of being in a brewery business without her saying, no, it's okay, just bear with it, get, get, it'll be okay. First year's the toughest, you know. Right. So, uh, I, I go to her for some, some mental support every now and then when I need it. Was, her and Joe are just salty there with people, and they're, they've done a lot for the community and animals and everything else. And right. All the stuff that she does. I just adore her. <laughs> so... When you started to open your brewery, how did you decide on the name? Uh, well, you know, our, this was not our first name choice. Uh, we actually were going to be Stag's Head Brewing. Uh, we went to our lawyer, because that was the first person we hired was a, was a lawyer right. in the industry. Derek Allen with Warden Smith. So we went to him, hey, we want to be Stag's Head Brewing. And he's like, hey, that's great. What's your second choice? <laughs> and we're like, well, we don't have a second choice. We've already filed for our LLC. This is what we want to be called. And he's like, yeah, that one's probably not going to go through trademarks very well. And he explained that there was one guy or one business and they had a beer name similar and they were probably going to stop the trademark. And, uh, but, you know, they let two others go through without fighting them, so we might have a chance. So he said, what's your second choice? Well, we don't have one. He goes, well, you should probably come up with at least one more, if not two more. And we're like, this is not easy. You, know? <laughs> you imagine you want to be in business for 20 years. How do you pick a name that you're going to be able to live with for 20 years? You know, it's... it's so we started thinking about it, you know, John and I are Scotch-Irish uh, descent. Um, he's a McFarland Knox Ayers, and I am a Cook Stewart. So uh, we're very much into our Celtic and, and history and stuff. And uh, the first piece of jewelry that my husband bought me was this pendant right here, this Triscoll. Yeah. We were at a little shop uh, in Fletcher called Crystal Visions, and it was like an old haunt of mine when I was like in high school. You know, it was like a store I liked to go into. So I took him in there uh, when we were dating. 
and we walked by the case. I'm like, oh, that's a pretty pendant. And he, as soon as I turned around and started looking at other things, he was getting the girl to get out of the case for me and he bought it. So, so yeah, we, uh, we started looking up the, like, what Triskel means or Triskelion means. And it's, a, it's kind of a Greek word. It means three legs. And uh, it actually dates back to like Greece and like the Mesopotamian time periods. And it was uh, three human legs coming off in a circle. And it's still being used as the Isle of Man and the Isle of Skies national flag. So the symbol has been around a lot longer than what people recognize as a Celtic symbol. But it traveled the trade routes, it ended up going through Gaul and up into Anglo-Saxon area where, again, where most people recognize it as Celtic. And then it also traveled over into like Mongolia and China and Japan and Korea as well. So it's, it's, it, the symbol has gone, and everywhere it goes it changed a little bit. But it's always been like three legs in a circle, and it kind of means uh, the past, present, future, it can mean growth and planting and you know, harvest, it, it, but it's always the changes, the seasons, the change that always goes around, goes around. Uh, for us though, I mean, with our, with our beer philosophy, I guess if you want to call it, uh, you know, we always, when we brew something true to style, we always want to honor that past, so that one leg of us is the past. One leg of us is the future, which we're always looking for, okay, what people are starting to like, how can we kind of go that direction? And also, what, what do people like today? So there's our three legs in, in the circle. It's always going around. So the stuff that we're brewing today will be past, you know, a hundred years from now, what we made today could be a classic style. You know? yeah. So we're, it's always changing, but yet it always goes around. So uh, that's kind of where we, we have our beer philosophy. Yeah. And it all started with this one little tiny pendant <laughs> around my neck. Yeah, I still wear it. Yeah. So this kind of ties into it. What do you see kind of as the, the main mission for Triskelion? Community. Yeah, community and definitely just good beer. <laughs> but we do like the community. Like I said, you know, I, I, I grew up here. Uh, there's not a whole lot of spaces to rent. There's not a whole lot of places for people to go and hang out. Um, you know, we're big time geeks. We, uh, we, we love gaming. So Monday nights, you know, we have a, a gaming night. We actually have now three DMs that come and run games, Dungeons and Dragons for us. And we'll, let's see, last uh, Monday we had like 30 people. We had three tables going, three DMs going all at the same time. It was a big geek fest, you know. So yeah, we, we, we have our community, and, but we also want everyone to have a space that they can feel comfortable in. You know? Yeah. That. And of course, tying into that is the beer. Be, uh, yeah. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about um, the beers that you guys are brewing? Do you have something that you consider your flagship? We have actually uh, several flagships. Uh, Moon Devil, which is a, uh, an IPA. It's very mango forward. Uh, that is like our number one seller. Another one, number one seller is a mango forward IPA so called Firefly. <laughs> yeah, we're geeks sometimes. Sorry, we are geeks. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Angelicious, which is uh, uh, one of my recipes, and it's a uh, tart blonde raspberry ale. And it's not really a style; it's like an experimental fruit beer style. Right. But it's uh, it, it's like I started with a blonde ale recipe, made it tart, and I added uh, lemon drop hops to give you that like lemonade. It's like summery, you know. It's like a raspberry lemonade beer. Yeah. And. Uh, it's, it's been well received. In fact, I'm, I'm out of it right now. I got it in a tank and it's cooking, but <laughs> I can't get it done fast enough for people yeah. who are drinking it dry. <laughs> so, so talking about the tanks, can you talk a little bit about the system that you guys have? Yeah, we went through Deutsch Beverage and uh, we had them engineer our system. It's a three and a half barrel. Uh, it is designed to double batch quickly. So uh, we can actually do a double batch in a day and fill up our seven barrel fermenters. And we have seven of those, so we call them our lucky sevens. Yeah. Uh, but we do have plans. I mean, uh, the brew house is not full yet. Uh, once we get the bar out that we had during our initial six months of opening, we had our tasting room back there. We will have room for uh, another row of fermenters, whether we go with 15s or we go with, we go with another row of 7s. We have room for a canning line that we're planning for. Uh, we also have uh, distribution that we're going to be starting up uh, around July, end of July. Mm -hmm. so we have that manager already hired. and. Yeah, he's going to be doing some good work for us. He's probably going to be dragging us behind him by our fingernails because he's going to—he's a, he's a go-getter. He's definitely a go-getter. So uh, people are already drinking us dry. So it's like, oh. <laughs> so are y'all going to start with just like local? Yeah, local. He's—he's he's got about a 200-mile radius planned. Cool. Um, wow. Yeah, cause that's bigger than just hyper local. Yeah, it's though. a little bit bigger than local. <laughs> but yeah, because he, he knows he can get from one end to the other in a day if he had to. If a customer needed him, he could get from one place yeah. to the other. So that's what he's shooting for. But uh, he has—he's uh, not actually a beer guy per se but he's been in distribution you know he's he's been a salesman so he knows how yeah. to sell things yeah and that's kind of what we need we, yeah we got beer guys <laughs> when you go out to sell you need kind of salesmen in, in my opinion and, and you know my dad was a salesman so yeah yeah so, so let's people. talk about some of the challenges that come with opening a new brewery <laughs> where do i start <laughs> wherever you would like 
I will say that the, the city people, the people that we have encountered during this process, the, 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 the officials, the people in inspections and, and people in zoning, I mean, everybody's been just kind and great and very supportive. The ordinance are horrible though. Uh, I'm not sure why, but I think somebody in the 80s, they decided to come here and like change all of our ordinances and make them really hard. Because when you do new construction, you're not granted and fathered in on anything. So we had 100 years of ordinances we had to follow, like no structural wood. You can't use wood. <laughs> Unless you fireproof paint it, and fireproof paint was $139 a gallon, and it covered about five or six studs, <laughs> so it, you need a lot of it, things like that. Things like that. I mean, and I, I, I understand that it's to keep people safe. It really is. And so, but I mean, it's just something you have to go through. Like we had to have an engineer do these plans, even though we're in construction. We were in construction. My husband knows how to do chief architect. He drew the plans. And we still had to have an engineer put a stamp on us before the zoning would let it go through. And, you know, that was a lot more money. Yeah. <laughs> Everything was a lot more money. So it's almost like, like the beer part wasn't the really challenging part no. in getting started <laughs> at all. Construction, just 100% yeah. construction. It's just, you know, it is the industry and it's why we were desperate to get out of it. <laughs> so yeah. We are so close. We are definitely so close. But yeah, that was, that was probably the biggest challenge is just maneuvering through the piles of ordinances that you have to, to follow to get a building brand new in this town. Yeah. Especially in city limits. Yeah. Right. So um, what would you say, now that you guys are up and operating, what would you say is your favorite part sitting in the tap room, having it's, beer with my customers. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I just like to sit here quietly and just watch, you know, and see and hear and like you, you pick up little comments. Like, I mean, like just like one, I've got a, a hundred rating on my health inspection, which is like, yay. <laughs> but you just sitting on the end of bar and, and the couple beside me are like, oh my God, look, they got a hundred. You never see hundreds here. This is amazing. <laughs> it's just kind of hearing that kind of stuff. It's like really fun. But I, I mean, I do like talking to people. I've, I've been a bookkeeper and an office manager for the last 20 years and I don't get out and talk to customers much. You yeah. know? I was always in the office, you know. Nobody came to me unless there was a problem and I had to deal with that. And now it's like I get to talk to people and I get to hear what they have to say and yeah. you know, you know, oh you have great beer. Oh yeah, you should do this and oh my god, look, you guys have this great thing going on. And it's just uh, that's my favorite part of the day. Yeah. Is the end of the day when I can I can hang up my brewer's hat and come in here and have a beer. <laughs> yeah. And I mean talking about the brewer's hat um, part. So you mentioned the fruit beer that you've worked on. Are there <laughs> others that, that kind of you consider your your babies? Well, I did a very traditional Saison and uh, it's already out again. I gotta get that back on the brew schedule. <laughs> so both of my beers are out. Now my husband though, I mean, he's got a, a brew called Shoujo, which is named after Japanese god of intoxication. If you wanna be geeky. Uh, <laughs> but it is, it's, an, it's like an Asian farmhouse. Uh, we brewed it with um, seeds of paradise and Thai basil and lemon drop hops. And so it's, it's super tart. Uh, it's not bordering on that sour though, but it is tart, and it's just, it's really good. It's its actually almost half gone. We just put it out on tap like a week ago, and it's already half gone. Wow. So we're, we're putting that one back, and I just ordered new materials for that, so we're yeah. getting that one back in, in, in the production cycle. It's, it's just phenomenal. We used a, um, a second generation of Corvindal Crec yeast, which uh, is kind of like an old Viking strain. They, they found it in a piece of equipment in a, in a farmhouse in Norway, and they were able to, to propagate the cells and. It took us a while to get that yeast strain, but uh, we read a lot about it, and it just it was phenomenal. The first brew we did with it was called Winter War, which was a um, just a farmhouse, but we brewed that one with juniper and ginger. Yeah, and it was good too. So yeah, when we did the second the shoujo, it, yeah, it's, yeah, the flavoring stuff. Are you guys are you sourcing it? Is it is some of it from around here? Some or? of it is. Yeah. Some yeah. Is. I mean, it, it's almost impossible to get everything local. Exactly. I wish I wish that it was different, but that's the way the world is. We, we get a lot of stuff from Country Malt, and uh, we've gotten some things from Riverbend Malts, White Labs, which is right up in Asheville. So yep. we, we like to go local if we can. Honestly, it's just because shipping times suck. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you know, when it takes like a week and a half to get stuff, you know, your hops are a week and a half out because they're coming out of California. Right. The distribution center, so it is a little difficult some days to, uh, to get everything in time for your, your brew days, you know. But uh, yeah, if we can get local, we buy local. Right. Like, you know, our, our grains are going to a local farmer. Uh, we're we're going to have a composting trash can here. She's going to pick that up for her oh. farm. Uh, you know, I buy meats right here. I get my hair done right down there. <laughs> <laughs> buy my coffee right here. <laughs> so, yeah, if I, can, if I can do as much local as I can, I do because you know, yeah. that's what community is about. So. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's your favorite part. 
can't all be sunshine. <laughs> what are some, like, now that you guys are up and operating, uh, what are, you know, what, what's your least? What, what's, what's the part that's just the most drag for you? Least favorite's not a good way of putting it. Sometimes just the comments. Yeah. Like the not so positive ones, you know, you, you can't please everybody and you get that, but some days your skin's just not very thick. And some days it's like, well, I did all this great thing, my heart and soul's in this, why can't you people like it? <laughs> And, and fortunately, we haven't had too many negative comments, but we have had a few. And yeah. it's, it's ones we take to heart. It's like, okay, let's see what we can do to change this. Let's fix this. But at the same time, it's like, you know, being in the public eye so much, it's, it's very daunting. I mean, we were, at a, we were at the grocery store, and somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and I turned around like, oh, my God, you're the Triskelion Company. Oh, my God, we follow you on Facebook, and we love what you're doing. And I'm like, yeah, great. Who are you? Because <laughs> I don't know who you are. <laughs> And uh, you know, people who like our business page will, will send me friends requests, and yeah. you know, you, you can't not accept them. You just you kind of have to just be in the public eye. And I I'm I'm not that I'm outgoing and I'm sociable, but on small scales. <laughs> so this yeah. is a little bit over the top for me. A little yeah, bit. yeah. I mean, especially you know, with kind of you were talking about more behind the scenes work yeah. before coming into this. Yeah, I coming into the, the you know, the open and just oof, it's a little daunting. <laughs> yeah. And it just, like I said, we, we went to a uh, beer camp, Sierra Nevada's beer camp. Some oh, yeah. customers of ours gave us tickets, really good customers. And uh, so we were there and like, yeah, we were getting recognized all over the place. And you know, it's like, we just want to have a day off <laughs> yeah. and then go enjoy beer. But when you own a brewery, you can't do that. There is no day off. I mean, we're always working. We're yeah. working, whether we're having a beer in our tap house, we're working in the brew house, we're working at the grocery store when somebody sees us and recognizes us from Facebook. It's just, we're always working. And I think that's that's been like a little bit harder to adjust to than anything else. Yeah, I would think especially being like that you're in your hometown that yeah. you've grown up in for forever and everything exactly. too. So yeah. that would be an extra. Like when you grow up in a place, you know everybody knows your mistakes. <laughs> everybody knows all the bad things you did. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm from a town that's much much smaller than this one, so uh, I understand. Well, like I said this was a smaller town at one time, but yeah. Uh, my husband, he graduated in Minnesota, and he graduated with 1,200, so he yeah. has no idea what it's like going places and being recognized until, yeah. until recently, but he's, a, he's much better at it than I am. I'm just like, oh, I don't want to see people I know today. <laughs> when you walk in, you just run to the grocery store in your yoga pants with slippers, and you got no makeup on, and somebody recognizes you, like, oh, how's the brewery going? I'm like, that's the part I don't think is this fun. <laughs> but it also means you have a lot of community support behind it you. It is a lot of community support, and, and uh, I do love that part of it. But like I said, yeah. I'm, I'm a little shyer than that. <laughs> so it's, it's, been a hard, uh, it's been the hardest to adjust to, yeah. I think. So thinking to the future, what, what you know, you have the tap room, the new tap room that you're working on, and the food truck. Can you talk a little bit about that and even other plans that you might have? Well, like I said, I think we're pretty well tapped out on the new stuff right now. <laughs> but within five years, I mean, we'll, we'll be stepping up a production. That building back there can support up to 5,000 barrels a year. So that's that's our five and 10 year mark. Is we're yeah. gonna hit half of that in five years and all of that in 10 years before we have to start looking for other properties. I said, this is my fourth startup company and my husband's, mine and his second together, so. Wow. Yeah, it's, uh, I think, yeah, we got a good plan. It's it's. But you know, like with everything, I mean, we're not fast food. We can't just like, ooh, look, pop up, there we are. You know, yeah. so things take time. Yeah. Uh, I think people, they don't realize how much time and effort and energy is like we've put in close to 18 hour days every day for months now, months without much of a day off. We've had one day off, we took Sunday off this week and that was it. That's the only day off I've had in like probably two or three months. Uh, you know, because we're chasing down construction. We're ch I mean, they're wiring speakers right now as we're doing this interview. So we're, right. we're still we're still putting things together. We're still fixing things. We're still getting things done, and trying to brew, and trying to sell her, and all the other stuff we have to do to make beer. So it's uh, right. it's a little overwhelming. But uh, we got we got a great team. Uh, you know, Ernest is uh, he's helping us out in the brew house now, as well as managing the tap room. Uh, we have uh, a full time bartender, Sam. She's amazing. She's been in the industry a long time. Has a lot of experience, and customers love her. Uh, we got new, uh, two new ones, Chris, uh, he's a young man, uh, he's been a bartender for a while too though. And then Matthew, he is a brew student who is looking to hopefully get into the next brewing position we have. And cool. So yeah, we got, we got plans because uh, the last thing, I mean, I know the first year or two or three is hard in any startup because again, done it. Uh, but we, we know how to delegate and we know that uh, 
you don't want to be here 24 7. nobody wants to be here 24 7. so our plan is to get processes in place and people in place mm -hmm. so we can walk away and enjoy a trip or we can walk away and spend a day with our son you know right. the, the place isn't going to fall apart if we we can't show up a day so that's what that's what we're getting to it's, uh, and it takes time yeah it takes time in any startup right and we we were talking before we started filming about the setup you guys are going to have here with the tap room and the uh, POS system and mm -hmm. Yeah, can you talk a little truck. bit about that? I can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, Viand is our food truck. It just means a specialty food. It's a French word. I think it's French. I think you told me it's French. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, they're going to be hopefully be open by 4th of July. And as you see, the food truck's already here. Uh, they're going to get a mural painted on it. That's one of the things they're going to do. And we will be tying their uh, POS in with our POS. So it's, uh, it's called Arrived, and it's actually, it was designed by a brewing company. And uh, we've, We've loved it. We've sw we switched over to it on Memorial Weekend. Uh, we were using Square, which is also a great POS system. Uh, but as a longtime office manager and bookkeeper, I hate credit cards behind the bar. I hate that. Absolutely hate it. I mean, it's, it's such a liability. If somebody were to grab that box of cards and run, you're liable for all those charges. And I, don't, I, I hate it. I, I, I hate leaving my card behind a bar because I've left my card in a bar before. <laughs> We were at the Philadelphia uh, conference and, and the big one yeah. two years ago, and we, we ran into Mitch Steele, who's the brewer for Stone, or not anymore, he's, he's up in Asheville now, but uh, he, got us, uh, he got us pretty well uh, buzzed. And <laughs> my husband gave the credit card to the bar to open up the tab, and I didn't realize that, so I gave him my credit card and opened up the bar. So when we were leaving, I'm like, did you close the tab out? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I got my card. Not even realizing, I thought he got my card. Yeah, <laughs> my card stayed at that bar for two days. Yeah, out of town. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I hate I hate credit cards behind the bar. I think yeah. that's the worst thing. And like you were saying, if somebody comes in and orders the the beer at the bar and they leave their credit card, how are they going to go out there and order food? Yeah. Unless they have a different card. Yeah. The, and yeah. you mentioned the the food the food trucks operated. It's going to be operated separately. Yeah, it is going to be operated separately. So if you're here, you order beer at the bar, but you order your food out there. But if you've ordered your beer at the bar and you've opened a tab, they can add the food to that tab. Yeah. You don't have to open up a separate tab. You don't have to have, have your So it'll card. be seamless. Yep. Yeah, That's exactly. a really cool system. Yeah. And when you open up a tab, we swipe the card and hand it back to you because it just, it keeps the credit card information in the system long enough to close the tab out and then it deletes it. So yeah. it is a very secure system. I was very pleased with that part of it. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't keep any customer information. Although I wish it did. <laughs> Square did. <laughs> I could look up everybody on Square. <laughs> but you can't do that with Arrived. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so you mentioned Pink Boots a little while ago. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about like Pink Boots in this area? How how each, each region seems to be opening their own Pink Boots chapter. Chapter. Yeah. And so can you talk a little bit about Pink Boots in this area? I can, although, you know, like I said, I, you're I've new. Only, yeah, I'm very new. Uh, I've only been a member for about two months, three months. Uh, my first introduction with them was a collaboration brew with Highland Brewing. That's where I met Katie and uh, Hillman Brandy. She was there uh, with Hillman Beer. Uh, a couple of other people I knew, but also some people I didn't know. Uh, I met this wonderful girl named Kim. She, she works at Riverbend uh, Malts. She was really fun to talk to. I was just, you know, it was a good day. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, I was really nervous because these, these were women that have been in this industry professionally a lot longer than me. Yeah. And then walk in there, you know, not knowing anybody. It was, it was again, I'm, I'm much more of a shy person. <laughs> and so it was really hard for me to go, just get up the gumption to go in there. And it's like, hi, I'm Becky. I'm Trish uh, But they were really welcoming, really friendly. They have uh, a great support system. I mean, everybody's really nice. You can ask them anything. Uh, just a good community. Uh, they do get together a lot more than I've been able to get together with them. They have a like a girls' pint night thing that's done separately by one of the other girls that is a Pink Boots member. Uh, I think they just had their um, their um, uh, chapter meeting this past Sunday, and I wasn't able to make that, so I can't tell you a whole lot. But I, yeah, I just think it's a great uh, concept. Um, I, I I've trained jujitsu, and uh, there is a whole like group of women, girls and geese, that support women in, in jujitsu, and and. Pink Boots has that same feeling, you know, it's just supportive, you can ask them anything, there's no embarrassing questions, you know, they're just, they're really open. Yeah. And, you know, I know I can call like any of them and say, hey, I've got this question, I'm having this problem with this yeast. I can call Joe at White Labs and say, I'm having trouble, I can't figure out why this yeast isn't doing what it's supposed to. She can, she can walk me through a whole a bunch of processes and, yeah. you know, she's, she's a good source of, of information. So. Yeah. And I mean, you know, brewing and beer is so stereotypically considered you know, I think when you picture a brewer, yeah, 
<laughs> Flannel and beards. Yeah. yeah can, you know, can you talk a little bit about I'm happy brewing? to talk about that. <laughs> there you go. Because <laughs> again, um, being just you know, not only just a co-owner but a brewer too yeah. with my husband, I, I, I yeah, I, I don't get the I guess the immediate respect. It's always a surprise. Oh, you brew too? It's almost you feel the mental pat on the head when they say that, you know, and it's usually. It's an older generation. I, I would say probably the early baby boomers. The, they're the ones that are more uh, guilty of that than, than some of the younger generations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, well, we were at beer camp and a couple walked by, oh, you're the Triskelion people. Oh my God. And so we were talking to him and so the, the older man, he looked at my husband and goes, you're the head brewer. What is she, the marketing girl? And <laughs> I just, I kind of looked at him and said, you know, I brew beer too. Women are allowed to brew beer in this country. You know that. And he, he kind of stuck a step out. His wife laughed. She just thought that was the funniest thing. And I went on and said, like, oh, you know, my husband lets me out of the kitchen every once in a while, put on shoes between babies. Just saying. <laughs> I had another guy at a party. He's like, oh, you brew beer too? That's kind of cool. You know, there's not that many women brewers in this country. I'm like, yeah, because um, America is really chauvinistic. Yeah. I go, in other countries, women are the brewers because we, we took care of the household and beer was part of the household. So, yeah. yeah. This is the only country where you think you, know, you have to have a beer and wear flannel. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> my favorite comeback is like, oh, well, you know, you're, 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 you don't have a beard. You can't be a brewer. And I'm like, I have a beard. I grow it on my legs. <laughs> I, I did jujitsu for a number of years, and I got the same kind of uh, respect from jujitsu. Yeah, and um, and you probably yeah. ran into that with some of the other startups too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But most yeah. of the most of the, the people in the industry are great. I mean, they, yeah. And I, 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 Asheville has a lot of women in the industry. I mean, a lot of women, whether it's packaging or cellaring or you know working at Riverbend. I mean, we have a lot of women in this industry in this area. I mean, maybe we're lucky. Mm -hmm. but it's not like that in other places and like i said again i found that with jujitsu it's like you don't if you're a woman and you wear a gi it's like oh do you train with your husband no he doesn't train i do it on my own you know <laughs> but <laughs> the funniest was uh in jujitsu especially like and i can't do that in brewing unfortunately because it would be really fun uh but i'd always have like a young kid and he'd be like not wanting to tap out to the girl in the dojo <laughs> so i'd literally hold him down for five minutes until he was like during the headlights panicking couldn't do anything to get out of anything that i was holding and i wouldn't even submit him i would just hold him and when we got done, I was like, are you going to respect me now? And he's like, yep. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh usually their friends are like, dude, you just got beat by a girl. And I turned to him, I was like, no. He got beat by somebody old enough to be his mom. <laughs> so, but yeah, That's you, awesome. You do, you do have to speak up for yourself in, in, in the industry. And again, the industry is great. I've had no issues with industry people. But it's usually that older generation of baby boomers that think that, you know, we, Especially, I don't know. Maybe we, we, we just can't do anything. We just we're in we're in home and we're taking care of the babies or we're doing office work, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's 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 it's, it's rather it's rather um, unsettling, I think, of how often it happens. Though. Yeah. I wish it didn't happen that much. But all we can do is is keep pioneering as women and keep moving forward and changing that perception. Yeah. And that's the only thing we can do is just keep fighting back a little bit, keep pushing, keep being smart asses. <laughs> <laughs> well, so if we had. A woman wander in and ask you, you know, how do I get into brewing or, or owning? Either one, mm -hmm. but mainly brewing. What would be your advice? I'd say for? look at Pink Boot Society. Start there because they have some scholarship funds and, and stuff that they do that you can apply for and go to school for it. Uh, and just start talking to people. Start talking to a lot of people about it. Uh, and find, find your support group because we're out here. You know, and just start small, start with a single, you know, five gallon batch and move on from there. But practice, yeah. you have to practice. You have to practice it a lot. <laughs> and, and it won't always be good. <laughs> Very yeah, true. Definitely go to school. I think that if you have the intention of opening a brewery, you need the formal education for it. Um, it's just, it helps it. It surprisingly helps. Again, we were on both sides of it. We were home brewers. And now we're professional brewers, or I guess we're professional. <laughs> professional something. <laughs> so I think though that going to school, I mean, we learned so many more tricks. Uh, when things go wrong, how do you fix it? You know, if you got diacetyl popping up, how do you fix that? You know, there's, there's steps that we didn't have access to. We didn't have access to that knowledge. You can search online all day long and you're not going to find specific questions like that. You, you really don't have many people you can talk to as homebrewers to get that right. information. So I think education is a, is a huge part of that. I think that, yeah, if you want to take it seriously, go get, go to school for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you kind of touched on this already, but what's your favorite part of just working in the craft beer industry in this area? Um, to be honest, I like the cellaring side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, you, anybody can make sugar water. <laughs> to, but not everybody can create recipes now. That's where it gets tricky. So the first step is to get the recipe right. Yeah. To, to get some kind of cool recipe that somebody can brew from or that you can brew from. So I think that's where it should start. But the whole brewing process, I mean, it's not that I'm, I'm a weakling. I can pick up a sack of grain. <laughs> uh, I can't quite pick it over my head, dump it in the mash tun. I pour mine in buckets and then dump the buckets. So uh, there is some things I have to do differently than my husband can pick that thing up. Uh, I don't know. I just I don't really enjoy that side of it. Uh, the, the cellaring side is much more my personality because I'm a little OCD. And there's a lot of sanitation, and there's a lot of following the steps, and you know, you got to check it this day, check it that way, check the gravity. I don't know, I'm finding that much more of my forte. You know, yeah. I'm getting good at carbonation, which has been tricky. Yeah. <laughs> when John went to school, I mean, he learned all about the room side, not so much the cellaring side. So I've had to kind of learn some things on my own, and, and again, Pink Boots and the other ladies in the industry that I'm comfortable, I can ask questions. They've been immensely helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, you, talk, you mentioned recipe development, and I'm always fascinated by this because I think different people come about it in different ways. When you're developing a recipe, like, how do you, what's your process in doing that? I approach it like I'm tasting food. Um, I've always loved cooking in my kitchen. Uh, I can't say that I'm a really great cook, but I do love it, and I love to like switch things around and change things. So, um, I don't know. I approach it like I'm, I'm, I'm literally like, okay, what do I want my food to taste like, and then I back it up from there. How do I get that taste? What malts are going to give me this flavor of beer? What malts are going to do that for me? What hops are going to give me these flavor profiles? And now, you know, when John brews, he brews more scientifically. He brews to specific gravity and ABV more, and I adjust those on the other end. So we, brew, we approach things a little differently. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's, I, you know, I, I think different people, like I said, come about it different ways, and yeah. so that's always interesting, interesting to me. So um, this is the tricky question that trips up brewers and brewery owners all the time. So what would you say is your favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery other than your own? And it can be your favorite today or some of your favorites. Well, I have to say, you know, growing up here, Highland, Highland Gaelic, that's, that's kind of a memory beer for me. Yeah. And not in the way you think. I mean, it was horrible the first time I tried it because again, I, I was young, you know, we, we, you don't drink craft beer when you're young, you drink what you can get cheap, and I was, I was a cheap beer girl, and, and somebody, you know, we went to, uh, up there, and somebody got me a Highland Gaelic, and I tried it, and I'm like, ooh, this is awful, <laughs> but, you know, I, I've learned over the years that you can never say never, that if I were to say that that was the one beer that got me started, and my enjoyment of craft beer, that was the one beer, because it, it opened up the door, even though I didn't like it first, it opened the door to try new flavors, to, to break out of my box and get something that wasn't dirt cheap and mm -hmm. something you know, that had a little bit more different flavors. So uh, that started that path. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of a memory beer. And it, I, I don't think it's changed in 20 years. I think it's the same beer. It's, it's still awesome. I, kudos to their, them and their consistency. Yeah. Because it's it, every time I drink it, I, I go back to that one moment in time where I was like, eh, I really like this. And then I think back like how far I've come, how much beer I've drank since then, and how much I've learned to love, you know. Uh, at one point, I hated IPAs. I was like, I'll never like IPAs, and IPAs are like my favorite style right now. Uh, another one is sours, you know. Um, I don't really like sours yet, but my experience is never say never, because what my taste buds like right now, once I educate them and know that what I'm tasting, what flavors are, uh, now, I, now I can start like breaking it down. I'm just like, okay, yeah, this isn't so bad. And the next time I try it, like, wow, this is really good. And, you know, there's, uh, as my, my uh, bar manager says, Ernest, he's like, you know what? You don't like IPAs? There's thousands of IPAs. Just because you don't like one doesn't mean you're not going to like the next one or the next one. Mm -hmm. Keep trying them until you find the one you like and just keep at it. And yeah. eventually, yeah, you'll find that one great beer you can't live without. And uh, yeah, so I think it was Highland Gaelic. That's yeah. the one beer that I, I, I just sticks out in my memory. Now, how about of your own? Do you have a favorite? Can you, can you pick a favorite amongst all of your beers here? <laughs> I'm kind of narcissistic. I like all my beers. <laughs> <laughs> I That's really, okay. truly do. That's acceptable. Uh, yeah. Uh, if, if the beer doesn't turn out, we dump it. So, uh, I don't know. It's just, I think it's really good beer. <laughs> so yeah. I do like my Angelicious. I mean, that was, I wanted a summer beer and I got one and now I can drink it whenever. I, well, actually I do try and drink the beers that we have the most inventory of because <laughs> when I know an inventory is getting low, I'll back off myself drinking that one so my customers can have more of it. <laughs> but, uh, so right now it's Gorilla. Gorilla is my favorite right now because it's the one we have the most inventory of. It's yeah. a West Coast IPA. It's kind of piney and bitter. Uh, I'm about to keg up a light American lager called Grumpy Hipster, 
and that one is probably going to be my next favorite. <laughs> yeah. So you guys are doing ales and lagers. Yes. Yeah, we do have a glycol system that we have double jacketed utility tanks, and so yeah, we can absolutely do lagers. And we have one called Beer's Beer Dude. <laughs> that was our bar manager that came up with that. Ernest, he's like. I just, when people come in and ask, what, what's like, what do you got this like Budweiser? He goes, beer's beer, dude. <laughs> and so, it's, like, it's a Mexican lager, so it's light, you know, imagine Corona, but better. And it's already got a lime flavor kind of built into it, with the yeast that we use and the hops that we use. So it's, it's really clean, crisp. It's, it's very drinkable this time of year. Uh, now, one of the first brews we did, um, we named it Trusted Advisor. Uh, after our lawyer, because <laughs> it was kind of the most expensive beer we did, uh, and named after the most expensive person in our employment. <laughs> so, but it was a it was a imperial coffee breakfast stout. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very complicated, very very much layered flavors in that one. Um, talk about buying local. Uh, I got the cold brewed coffee from next door. They roast their own beans. I, I got a Sumatran. I I brewed up tw 11 gallons of cold brew, and that's what went into the final product. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah, we like I said, when we brew something true to style, we try and get it as true to style as we can, and yeah, and we, and we try and buy local. So right, yeah, that was a very expensive coffee purchase. <laughs> you want how much coffee? <laughs> so much. thinking about the industry as a whole, not just you guys, but like this whole area, where do you see things going in the next few years? Like the beer industry in Western North Carolina. I don't think it's, uh, you hear a lot of people talking about it's busting. It, you're, we're going to hit our cap, uh, the bubble's going to burst, you know, it's like the housing market, you know, that we went through in 2007. I don't think that. I don't think that it's going to do that at all. I think it's going to change, yes, because it has to. You can't stay still. Uh, I think what's going to happen is, though, going back to the education. Uh, when a home brewer, you know, even a really good home brewer is, tries to open up a professional production brewing system, um, I think they struggle a lot, and we've start, we started to see some of that here. We've seen two or three breweries already starting to close, uh, again, because their beer was average to, you know, they, they couldn't compete quality-wise. They had a great, they had a great uh, place, they, they had great service, uh, but, you know, when you have a couple of beers and they all have, like, a certain flavor profile to it, you know, it's not, not coming out of their hops, it's, it's a problem. And uh, we started seeing those people go out of business, and it's unfortunate because, you know, everybody wants a dream and live a dream, and it's, it's horrible to see a business go out of out of business just because you know there's a it's just sad you know I know what it would mean to me if this place went under you know it'd break my heart so I hate seeing that but I think that the education if people really want to take brewing seriously and they really want to keep this industry growing then they need to educate themselves they need to go back to school they need to learn it they need to learn it from a professional side and not just from a homebrew side yeah I think that's extremely important I think that's what gave us our leg up you know gave us that push that we needed to get into a business that we, we hope is a, a lot more successful than it would have been. And I can tell you, just the knowledge base. We did not know what we know now a year or two years ago. When, you know, even when John was still in school, we did not know this stuff. Right. You know, it, it was a really good program. And I, I know that AB is, is equally as I mean, it's a good program up in Asheville. Uh, there's a, a lot of kids coming out of there that are just phenomenal brewers. And right. they, they got a leg up on this industry already. Uh, they got a leg up on getting a job. They got a leg up on, on just being in the service industry in general. Uh, but, you know, they're also, you know, the problem with that is they're also competing for very limited spaces <laughs> in this area. Now, if they go outside this area, that's great, but having an area with two amazing brew schools, uh, it's very competitive here. Bartending's very competitive. Yeah. You know, and most of the brewers that I know, that they're coming out of school, they work as bartenders so they can hopefully get a spot in a brew house. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's just, it's, 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 an, it's insane, you know, I mean, but I think that, I think that that's how the market's going to change is we're all going to have to step up our game. We're not really competing with each other, but we're cons we're competing against a consumer base that is becoming more and more educated about what great beer is, and they're the ones that are going to drive the differences in this market. They're going to be the ones that are driving the change. And I mean, again, it's like one of the, the the largest segments coming up are women millennials. Women millennials are drinking a ton of beer right now, a ton of craft beer. And if we don't cater to that market, we don't step our game up to cater to them and what they want, then you know we're missing out on a big, huge segment of the market. I mean, I think that's where the, a lot of the big guys are getting in, into struggles because they, they have banked on this whole brand loyal mm -hmm. uh, thing that they've had with the older generations. I mean, my, my parents and my uncles and everything, they drank Budweiser or they drank Miller's. I mean, they always drank these beer. They were so brand loyal that they, no, I won't drink that. That's not that. I, but now, I mean, we've got a whole, you know, we have like three generations past them now that are, are epicurial. Mm -hmm. They're like, I come to a place like, what's new? What do you got that's new? You know, I had that last week. What do you got new? You know, I hear that all the time. What's new? What's new? What's new? And they're the ones that really drive craft beer. And it's, I think it's scaring the big guys to death because they don't understand it. 
you know, I, I think that's really where it's going to be. Yeah. We're going to grow bigger and bigger collectively. You know, we're not going to be one big conglomerate. We're going to be collectively because you know the generations they're they're looking for they're looking for community. They're looking for how to support local, and they're looking for great beer because they they know what great beer tastes like. And the people that are just they're subpar. I think those are the ones that are going to go out of business. Yeah. I don't think if somebody makes great beer and they have a great location, they got great uh, you know events. I, I don't think they're going to they're going to lose that. Yeah. I think that the ones that don't have that will. Because I think that's how the market's going to change. Yeah. That makes sense. So you were talking about 18 hour days. So this may be an absolutely ridiculous question, but what do you do for fun when you're not here? <laughs> well, we have our bikes in the back now. So <laughs> we have the Oklawaha trail, literally two or three blocks down the street. So it connects all the parts in Henderson County, uh, Jackson Park, Patton Park, and on up to Berkeley Mills. So yeah, we, we take a lunch break uh, when we can, when we're not brewing, because when you're brewing, you just have to be around for that. But if we're just doing cellaring or if we're doing um, paperwork, yeah, well, let's go to lunch. We'll hop on our bikes, we'll ride up to, through the trail, we'll hit the park and then we'll go like subway and then go back through the park and back here. So yeah, it's what we're doing for fun right now. Yeah. Uh, typically in the past, we do medieval sword fighting. We play a game called Dagger here and it's a foam weapon. It's not LARPing because we're full contact. We beat the hell out of you. <laughs> <laughs> that's something we do for fun uh, and you know jiu-jitsu too I've, I haven't had much time for jiu-jitsu in the last year but hopefully get back to it yeah did you do competitive uh, I did not compete no. okay. mostly I did women's self-defense classes I taught kids um, uh, I was just you know worked on getting uh, up through the ranks uh, so I'm almost a purple belt been doing it for five years so that's yeah awesome <laughs> and it's a lot of fun a lot of exercise too yeah you can burn it like 500 calories a night doing jiu-jitsu yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like rolling, when you're rolling, you're, you're fighting. It's like uh, running while weightlifting while playing mental chess all at the same time. It's, it's intense and yeah, I like that. I like the, the challenge of it. Uh, working out is boring to me. Yeah. Although working out back here, you know, <laughs> we have this great exercise place right beside us and they, you should come work out with me. And I looked at her and I said, girl, you should come wash kegs with me. <laughs> Cause yeah. they, weigh, they weigh about 12 pounds a piece and you have to lift them eight times when you're washing them for the three cycles. And I said, so you should come, you should come work out with me. We'll see who has a better workout. And she goes, can I send some folks over <laughs> as part of the CrossFit? I'm like, yep. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize how physical. Very physical, very, very physical. Uh, I was shocked, you know, I mean, brewing on a, 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 five, a five gallon system is nothing like brewing on a three and a half barrel. <laughs> it's a lot of work. The kegs are heavy, the equipment's heavy, the, the grains are heavy, you know, and uh, it's an eight hour day in the brew house and that's a half batch that's only a three and a half barrel when we do seven we're we're here 12 hours and we're splitting like yeah. john starts ernest comes in in the middle and i finish I'm, I'm at the end you know making sure everything's cleaned and put away yeah yeah but it's uh it's fun <laughs> yeah it gets hot back there though. i'm sure <laughs> it does our, our big ass fan <laughs> <laughs> it, it still gets really bacon hot in there when the, when the boiler's going so. yeah yeah but they have it. most people don't realize how dangerous it is um, you know, if you ever boiled spaghetti over in your stove, imagine 100 gallons coming out you at one time and you got a platform that you have to jump off of before you get scalded with 212 degree boiling sugar water. And not to mention the mash tun and we got paddles that go around and if we're cleaning and, and I look away for a second, I think I take my arm off or at the least, you know, and, and the chemicals use parasitic and, and caustic soda. I mean, I have to like suit up like I'm going to Mars <laughs> when, I, when I get ready to like pour out chemicals. <laughs> so, I mean, people don't realize. Uh, how dangerous it really is to brew beer. It's, yeah. This is manufacturing at yeah. this level. This is absolutely manufacturing. And, you know, people just, it, it does it does surprise me how many people just walk in, you know. We have the doors open because it's 90 degrees in there. We have little barriers across our, our, our uh, garage doors, but people still just walk in, hey, hey, how you guys doing? It's just coming in to see how you're doing, you know. Like, uh, working? <laughs> and I have to explain, it's like, well, if I come to your job, you know, and I sit there and just chat with you and you're trying to get stuff done, I mean, it's not exactly fun, is it? And I didn't think about that. I'm like, well, what do you think? We sit here all day and drink beer. <laughs> well, I, I guess I did think that. <laughs> I don't, it is very uh, glamorous to be a brewer. And um, I don't know why. <laughs> after a day of brewing, I'm nasty. I'm sweaty. And my hair's all frizzed out because it's curly naturally. And, and you know, by the time I get done, it's like a clown, you know, because <laughs> all the humidity back there. <laughs> and I go home like exhausted. Yay, brewing is fun. <laughs> But yeah. it, is, it is a lot of fun. But then you get to sit and listen to people talk. And then I get to see people enjoying what I make. And that's, you know, I, just, I love making stuff, you know. Uh, I was a knife maker for a while, and I tell you, oh. that was fun. Um, that was one of my startups, is I, I was a custom knife maker. So I would talk to customers, they would order a hunting or fishing knife from me, and I would manufacture it in my dad's shop. And I, I did that for about four years, loved it. 
Yeah. Uh, it's just having something that you make, you know, that lives on a lot longer than you. Uh, I know, you know, my knives will probably be passed down to kids, you know, and their kids, you know, who knows, maybe 500 years from now, somebody will be like, oh, look, there's an RDA'er's knife, you know, you know that, that's, that, that's a lot, you know, that hits you kind of here, you know, it's like, I can live on <laughs> yeah. with what I make. Uh, not that, you know, beer will last that much long. <laughs> You're not going to sell it for that long. Not going to sell it for that long. No. But, but yeah, you, when you make something, that's, it's a good feeling, you know, it's a part of you. It's like your heart and soul goes into that product. Yeah. Um, I think that's what I really enjoy. It makes all the long hours and sweat and <laughs> muscle soreness <laughs> and back aches and everything else. <laughs> makes it all worth it. <laughs> yeah. So I guess it is a, it is a fun industry. Yeah. So the camaraderie around it is great and it's being able to do what you love. You know, I quit my job in October and I haven't worked a day since. I've worked my butt off, but I have not worked a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's the end of the questions that I came oh, cool. with. Right, but did you have, is there anything we didn't talk about that you wanted no, to talk about in order to kind of get the full everything. story? <laughs> yeah. No, this was, this was great. Well, thank you. Thank you very appreciate much. It. We really appreciate yeah, it. It was fun.